Welcome to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast for farmers and ag professionals by the Iowa Farm Bureau, bringing you the news, experts, and educational insights that matter most. Now, here's your host. Welcome to this special November 9th edition of The Spokesman Speaks podcast. I'm Andrew Wheeler, and today's episode is the first part of a three-part series that we're bringing to you over the next few weeks. In late October, we brought together three Midwestern Farm Bureau economists, Iowa Farm Bureau Senior Economist Dr. Sam Funk, Nebraska Farm Bureau Senior Economist Jay Rempe, and Illinois Farm Bureau Senior Economist Mike Doherty, who had a robust recording of a virtual meeting that lasted more than an hour. During that discussion, we really drilled into some of their insights into 2020, as well as their predictions looking further out into the future. We'll split that discussion into three parts that we'll release to you over the next couple of weeks. Right now, I actually have Dr. Sam Funk here with me. Now, Sam, it was your idea to bring this group together. Tell us why you thought it was important to do this special series now, and at a high level, what you think farmers will gain from this discussion. Well, glad to be here with you, Andrew. You know, part of the aspect of having the three economists from these Midwestern states come together is really just to kind of show what things are similar amongst our states and what are different as we look at trying to bring this information together with several of the topics that will be raised in these podcasts. How do our different states and our members view these, and what do we do as economists in order to address certain issues that arise day-to-day or sometimes in a very unique fashion, such as we'll see with COVID? Now, this podcast series is actually a precursor for a larger webinar series that you're planning for farmers in 2021. Why don't you tell us about that and where farmers can go to stay tuned for the details? Sure. So normally we would have in-person an IFBF economic summit. This year, obviously, COVID put a crimp on a lot of plans that we have as an organization and obviously in our day-to-day living. So if we think about what we wanted to do, we still want to get some very high-level information out for our members to be able to understand what that current leading-edge economic thought is and bring it out through there. So what we want to do is coming into the beginning part of 2021 is to actually have the IFBF economic summit webinar series. And so that webinar will actually have a video presentation that people will be able to log on and be able to provide questions while we're going through that and also then view the recorded webinar later on as they might want to. So where is that one going to be coming up? Well, I think for one thing, we'll have it uh, mentioned again on some of these podcasts with the Spokesman Speaks. There will probably be uh, articles coming out with the Spokesman. And then we'll actually put a lot of that information when all the dates and times are known for these webinar series. We'll put that on Iowa Farm Bureau. Dot com. So people can obviously go to the website and be able to see when those events are going to take place. But we anticipate just with some of the speakers we've already lined up, it'll be some very interesting topics that many of our farm families will be interested in being able to attend those webinars virtually and get that information. Well, we'll definitely look forward to that upcoming webinar series, which our listeners will be hearing a lot more about in this podcast in the Spokesman newspaper, and on our website as we inch closer to 2021. And Sam, thanks for pulling this group of economists together. I know our listeners really appreciate their expert insight. You know, it's always one of those great things to be able to bring good people together to hear from them. And I think there's going to be a lot of information that our members and others are going to be able to hear through these podcasts for just if you get three economists together from these Midwestern State Farm Bureaus, what do we think about and where do some of our topics range when we get into these deeper discussions? All right, let's get to it. Spokesman Editor Dirk Steimel takes it from here. We're here with Sam Funk, senior economist with the Iowa Farm Bureau Federation, and two of his counterparts from neighboring states, Jay Rempe, economist with the Nebraska Farm Bureau, and Mike Doherty from the Illinois Farm Bureau. Today, we're going to discuss the state of the Midwest farm economy and the economic outlook for farmers as we head into 2021. Let's talk first about the farm income outlook in each of your states. Let's move west to east, and we'll start with you, Jay. Well, thank you, Dirk, and and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I I certainly appreciate that and appreciate appearing with with Sam and Mike. And 
And I, I'm sure I'll learn something out of this discussion today as well. Uh, in Nebraska, uh, actually, considering COVID and everything that's happened in 2020, uh, things are looking fairly uh, decent right now in terms of farm income. The latest numbers or projections that we've seen project an increase in farming income this year. Uh, we may hit close to $6 billion in net farm income. Last year, we had uh, USDA estimated about a 4.2 billion net farm income in the state of Nebraska. And so we're seeing the increase and there's a couple of reasons for that, I think. One is uh, the higher commodity prices that we've had here in the last few months. And, and that certainly will help with the crop receipts and the, and the livestock receipts. Most of, if tradition or history holds, most of our crop is marketed from September through December of the year, or at least 43% of it is. And so we should see some higher receipts out of that. But then the government assistance that we've saw, seen out of COVID is, has been a big, big thing too, as well for farm income. At the farm level, it's been a little bit, I call it kind of the tale of two farms. We, I think we have a, a cohort of farmers that are doing well, they're keeping their costs under control, they're managing things and they're able to break even or see positive returns out of even the commodity prices that we've seen this year. But then we have another segment that I think is really struggling. They came into the year working capital, they burned through, they are they're having trouble meeting their short-term debts. And, and so it, it's kind of a tale of, of two different farms there, if, if you will. I think the government assistance this year is helping those on the low end manage through that this year. I'm a little concerned what 2021 might mean for them in terms of uh, trying to, to generate some farm income, some positive returns, given the level of commodity prices. Well, I think we'll have to see commodity prices go up a little more for them to, to see some positive returns. But overall, sitting right now, I, I, I'm feeling a lot better and a lot more positive about where we're standing at this point than I would have said four or five months ago, that's for sure. Sam, what's your take on the outlook in Iowa? You know, I, I think that Jay brings up a lot of really good points and it, it's, you know, the tale of two farms, I think is a great way to phrase it, but you've always got that pressure out through there. And I think it's a matter of timing for a lot of people. I mean, obviously 2020 was just an extremely challenging year. Um, I, everybody knows COVID was such a, a big driver. And so if I was a livestock producer, uh, through the early portions of COVID and didn't necessarily get to market all of my pigs. Maybe I had some difficulty getting uh, my cattle marketed out through uh, the state. This was a really challenging year. And I think farm income for some of these producers will show that it, it was a challenging year. And for some, it'll, it'll be significant moving on even into next year, trying to recoup some of those losses on what had taken place this year. So I think it's a matter of that that timing aspect. If, if on the other hand, I happen to be one of those producers who still had uh, some soybeans that I uh, hadn't marketed yet, and after these prices started to take their strides toward these multi-year highs here recently, I might feel really good. Uh, the farm income situation for me uh, could be a, a completely 180 from what I fear that it might have been. Uh, because I've got a lot more market opportunity to be able to uh, market that crop. So, you know, that's one of those aspects that, you know, if you could have projected that we would be having futures prices for soybeans that on the nearby contract would have put us up in the, you know, 1090 range. And if you would have thought that I could market beans directly from the field for close to $10 in several areas around Iowa, um, boy, you were you were a stronger marketer than most other who's around there, um, you know. And this is on the tail of, you know, after we had Phase One, and even though we had Phase One agreement in place with China buying, uh, you know, all of these agricultural commodities that were scheduled to go out, I mean, we didn't see prices increase for quite some time afterwards. So um, I think it's a it's a, it's a very much this, you know, the tale of two farms. I think works, or the tale of what time. Um, you know, what, what situation do I find myself in? There will be some producers out there maybe who had an investment in some of those pig barns. They may not actually have another load of pigs coming back in to fill up those barns. So th there's a wide variety of challenges which could take place. And, you know, we can talk about the aggregate numbers through there and, and, and how that comes to place. I think there were a lot of programs people could avail themselves to. But the farm income situation, I think, will be very individualized 
for what does it mean to each individual farmer in what situation they're going to face. Mike, how about on your side of the river? Well, uh, Sam and uh, Jay have really captured it well, uh, a lot of the dynamics, uh, in, and they apply here to Illinois as well. Uh, however, there's some differences. Uh, Illinois is much more grain dependent. Corn and soybean rotation is 80% of our revenues, which is higher percentage than in Iowa or Nebraska, where they have more livestock. So we're very sensitive here in Illinois as far as overall farm income to those corn and soybean prices. And uh, yes, to Sam's point, this has been a phenomenal turnaround late in the season, something we rarely see with these cash soybean prices uh, currently at around uh, $10.50 a bushel here in central Illinois. And um, that is going to result in the highest net farm income for a corn and soybean rotation since 2013. So that's the good, the good news. And that was unexpected. On the other hand, we also have pretty much the same level of debt leveraging and working capital constraints and low working capital that we had liquidity levels being low that we had going into this year. That tier of farmers, according to the economic research that's been done, some of it I've reviewed that was done by Iowa State that was excellent, shows that uh, the farmers who uh, through the last five to seven years had uh, tight liquidity, high debt to their asset levels, uh, and, and on the verge of or experiencing credit problems in terms of loan repayment, they will probably continue to have those problems going into 2021. The only difference is, is that, they, that uh, the ones that might have completely capsized uh, will have maybe been saved by the high soybean prices. So that cut speaks to what Jay is talking about, about tale of two farms. Uh, you've got the ones that came into this year financially stressed, and they're going to largely still be somewhat stressed going into 2021. And then you've got the other ones that were not all that stressed. And for them, these high soybean prices are really going to help their bottom line and, and hopefully uh, really maybe even increase a little bit of their working capital. Thanks, Mike. Now let's think a little bit about uh, farm credit conditions. Are there signals or of any issues that lenders are seeing as farmers get ready to talk to their lenders about loans for 2021? Jay, you got any? Do you have a feel for that? Yeah, you know, it's been kind of interesting because coming into the year again, I, we were seeing some signals that uh, were a little troubling in the way of farm credit. Overall debt was going up, was growing. Uh, our Farm Business Association here in the state showed that in their membership, uh, debt has increased over 40% over the last five years. And then we saw some creeping up of the loan repayment rates uh, in terms of default on those repayments. And some other signs out there that, that were just kind of uh, saying, eh, that, that we're seeing some more problems here. And then uh, for Nebraska, unfortunately, through at least the first half of this year, if you look uh, from June 30th to the year prior, we had the second highest number of farm bankruptcies uh, in the nation, only behind Wisconsin. And I think Wisconsin's is related to the dairy industry there. I'm not sure exactly uh, what's driving uh, Nebraska's in that regard. Although I will say, I know Sam and Mike and their states the Midwest, we've, we've seen higher bankruptcy rates than relative to the rest of the country. It, uh, so at, at coming into the year, it's a little bit troubling. I did see some reports here in the last week or so that saying that uh, the amount of uh, loans uh, is is slowing down a little bit or the debt levels are slowing down a little bit and that they think that's an indication of both the, the higher commodity prices and, and some of the government assistance programs. So maybe we're kind of stabilized a little bit in that regard and uh, we've got a bit of a timeout in terms of where we're going to head from now on. But it's been, as Mike alluded to, some of those debt to asset ratios and some of the other things have been slowly creeping and, and getting worse over time and, and uh, having some troubling trends. Now, when you look at historically, at least in Nebraska, we're still below where we've been in some in some really troubling times, but still you hate to see those trends uh, the way they were going. Mike, do you see the same issues there in Illinois? Yes. Uh, in fact, we got a breakout on this from the Chicago Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, they do an index on loans that are either in major or severe repayment issue uh, status. And we found that uh, in that analysis, 
that the percentage of those loans in either major or severe repayment status um, issues, that percentage doubled between second quarter of 2019 and the second quarter of 2020. Um, and it's quite strong, uh, almost 12, 13% of all farm loans in the western and northern northwestern part of Illinois. Now, the question is, how much will those higher soybean prices help those uh, troubled loans uh, on those farms? We don't know. And the other thing we don't know is what percentage of those loans were livestock, particularly hog farmers, who had uh, suffered with very low hog prices through a good portion of 2020 and uh, are just now starting to make up for that with higher hog prices. So um, it's yet to be seen how this will wash out for 2021, but that measurement, that index of repayment issues with either major or severe repayment issues for loans in Illinois uh, has been increasing uh, every uh, year, according to that analysis by the Chicago Federal Reserve over the past five years. So. Um, so yeah, so it's it's definitely a concern. We're also hearing a lot about the hog farmers that, that we'll wait and see how they come out at the end of this year. They are expected to show quite a bit of financial stress because of those low hog prices earlier. Sam, a lot of hogs here in Iowa. Uh, how do farm credit conditions look here? It's obviously been one of these aspects that it's not just because of COVID that we've had these farm uh, income aspects, which have uh, spilled over into some credit conditions that haven't been favorable. We are uh, in in Iowa. We're actually in the Chicago Federal Reserve District as well. And so uh, not just looking state by state, but in the, the whole district uh, out through here. I mean, we've got those farms that are, as Mike had alluded to, in that uh, um, difficult situation. I mean, we're at the highest we've been since uh, before 2000, as far as for the number of farm loans, which are showing uh, that higher level of distress, if you will. So it's really important that we start to think about really what's been driving that. Yes, we've been seeing uh, increasing numbers of farm bankruptcies. Now, those farm bankruptcies uh, typically are somebody, they, they could be looking for restructuring. There's all sorts of different aspects where people use that uh, farm bankruptcy, the, the code that's out there in order to restructure, maybe gain some uh, foothold to be able to start back. Uh, so there's a lot of things that drive different uh, reasons why you might think about uh, some of those those numbers out there and that increasing out through. Um, you know, so it hasn't been a challenge for a lot of people has been a challenge without a doubt. I mean, we're talking about, you know, years now, year on year of uh, lower farm commodity prices, especially for those uh, Midwestern crops and the livestock that we've added through here with with some, you know, uh, every once in a while you'll have those blips that'll happen because of some sort of supply uh, in, in some major exporting country in the world uh, that gives some sort of hope to be able to lift up those markets. So, you know, there's a lot of different things that come in through here. And you've seen a lot of uh, folks who have gone into their lenders and they've taken what had been short-term debt and converted it over into some sort of a long-term debt because of borrowing against what had been a very strong land value base that they've got. And when they take those assets and they start to borrow against them, you make what had been a, a one-year issue and in order to continue farming, you made it into a multi-year issue. So it, it's not that it was a wrong move, but it can be a challenging move to work your way back out of that in a lot of different regards. But, you know, uh, low uh, cost of money as far as for a lot of interest rates that hadn't been uh, increasing as much as some might have projected um, and the ability to transfer uh, to a to a land uh, valuation use that land asset. There's there's a lot of things that have changed in agriculture, and a lot of issues that could come back to uh, potentially need to be worked out of over the next couple of years. Ad hoc uh, government payments have made up a big share of farm income the last few years. There's a whole alphabet soup of them: MFP, CFAP, CFAP2. Do you believe that farmers are prepared for a reduction in those payments in 2021 and beyond? Jay, what do you think? That's been one of the, the trends over the last two or three years that we've been watching and, and it kind of concerned me a little bit when you look at the underlying sources of income for farmers and ranchers 
and whether they're deriving that from the market or the government. And, and we're seeing here in Nebraska, potentially this year, somewhere between 35 and 40 percent of the, the farm net farm income will be government assistance payments. That, that, and uh, so as we look to next year, I, I hate to say this, but I don't think the majority of farmers have thought about that yet. They're in the process of trying to get their their crops out of uh, get harvest completed and get things taken care of. At this point, I, I, I don't see think where a lot of them have thought about, OK, what about next year and how do we cash flow things? And, and they'll start those conversations with their bankers here uh, yet this year and, and start having figuring that out a little bit. Uh, again, I, I think those those ones that are, are setting pretty well financially, uh, it's not much of a concern to them because they got things under control regardless. It's those on the on the other end of the scale that are probably it'll tip the balance one way or another, I think, next year on, on some things. Sam, uh, Iowa got the most of those payments, uh, uh, the largest share that we've seen of any state. How about a withdrawal of those payments? How will that affect farmers in Iowa? Well, you know, it really depends on what the markets are going to look like going into next year. I mean, I think that's the, you know, uh, if you will, that's the $100 billion question, right? If we have strong markets that are uh, uh, improving for corn and soybeans, and if we see some strength in livestock markets through here for hogs and for cattle, uh, and if the dairy markets can decide to stay strong instead of being able to do this uh, yo-yo levels out through there, we could have some producers who are able to make substantial gains and be able to improve their financial situation, both with the number of uh, farm loans that we see out there, as well as building that working capital that Mike had mentioned earlier, and, and really improving that overall net farm income picture. I mean, if we don't have COVID slowing down our economy, if we have strong market movements with uh, now that we've got, you know, if China's really going to get to the phase one, if we're going to have USMCA working uh, as we hope it, it would for exports of agricultural products, uh, both to the north and south, to Canada and Mexico, if we can continue to keep, uh, you know, some high value beef and pork moving to uh, Japan moving into Korea, but all of these countries, I mean, Japan stage one, uh, chorus, which is the U S uh, Korean, uh, trade agreement. If, if these things all come to play and we can keep these markets strong and going, um, there's a potential for the export market and the domestic market in order to support farm income through here. And that's what frankly, um, most producers that I know of would like to be able to see those markets continue to ramp up. Now, there's a lot of questions that come into that when we get to uh, what's going to happen with the ethanol markets, what's going to happen with biodiesel, you know, and really where where do we go? Is COVID going to have, you know, this broad sweeping uh, change coming back in here through this fall and into the winter? Uh, is it, is it going to be an issue? Are we going to see people get back and start driving and using more transportation fuel so that we'll have strong demand for corn going to ethanol markets? There's a lot of questions that come up, but right now, at least, there's actually some uh, very strong potential and opportunity. And if people would make some marketing uh, plans right now, utilizing the futures uh, market that's out there and available right now, there's potential to lock in some market-based prices for at least our corn and soy at this point in time going out into future years. Mike, I'll go over to you and let's talk a little bit about international trade, as Sam mentioned. Uh, what's the outlook, uh, as you see, from a from a crop standpoint, since Illinois is so heavily with crops? Well, it's a it's a good question, and there's a lot of concern over what that outlook is um, after about March to April of next year. And to Sam's point, you know, so much depends on how much demand we're going to have for corn and soybeans and what that and keeping those prices up. Uh, there's a scenario that is not very optimistic on that uh, going in, in into the middle of 2021 when you know that you've got Brazil estimated to expand their soybean acreage by 3 percent uh, in their plantings in, over this coming winter. It'll be their summer. And Nowadays, when they expand soybeans by 3%, they're expanding their safrina corn crop right along with it. Used to be you only worried about the soybean side of that equation. Now you got to worry about the expansion of both corn and soybeans. 
they are pulling a lot of their corn off and feeding it into new corn fed ethanol plants. However, that means we don't we lose our ethanol export market to Brazil. So we've got that uh, potential depressing effect on prices uh, probably be somewhere between March to May of next spring for our corn and soybean prices. Then on also at the same time, you could have a curtailing of this China demand about that same time, and they could start picking up those Brazilian supplies. So we're really quite concerned that there could be a, a sharp fall off in these uh, prices. Uh, and, and you could see that in the futures market with the lack of carry on those contracts. That's what the market's telling us, that uh, that's a valid concern. You've also got the long-term trend here to be aware of that our corn and soybean farmers have continued to outproduce demand uh, overall. And that's been much talked about. And this year, yes, we had high prices, but it came with a much lower production than predicted in Iowa. So Illinois has benefited from that, along with uh, a less or a uh, somewhat of a surprise level of demand on the corn side in China. So that's sort of like getting lucky for a year. Uh, what's going to happen next year? If we get back to more normal conditions, uh, they have a good crop down in South America and uh, Iowa has a good crop. Our, our biggest competitor in corn and soybeans domestically, um, we could end up right back to some pretty low prices and, and with that, some lower farm income. Let me tail in there to Mike's point about uh, thinking about how th things have come together. The first thing to do to look at uh, for what we expect prices to do, obviously an easy one is to look at CME contracts out there for soybeans and corn. And frankly, right now for soybeans, it's telling you take that crop to market now. Don't store the soybeans. Uh, there is no carry in the market, so there's no premium uh, built in the market for being able to hold an out month. It's saying deliver it now. Uh, so that risk that Mike is talking about with uh, having more production coming out of Brazil, you know, not just that, which that's a, a physical, tangible risk for production down through there, uh, but the market itself is telling you bring that crop in and sell it right now. So that's what basis levels, that's what everything else is telling us. You need to get that crop sold. Now, at the same time that we're talking about getting that crop sold, the basis levels between what's uh, typically higher basis for us here in Iowa along that Mississippi River, and now we see that we're getting strength into the basis level in the interior of Iowa, and that's partly uh, even for, uh, for corn, because they're saying, you know what, we can't let all of our corn go down the river to export. We need to have that corn here in the state to be able to fuel our ethanol production and to be able to feed to those livestock. So there, there's a lot of changes they're telling us, but it doesn't say don't market it. It says you can market it, by the way, we're gonna need part of it just to stay right here. So th there, there's a very strong market signal. Now let's talk about some of the things that are driving some of these shifts out through here. Uh, and, and I made this comment just a couple of months ago where I had graphics that looked at uh, how many soybeans that China was getting out of Brazil. Even though we had the phase one agreement, if you were to look at it, uh, they were buying so many soybeans out of Brazil to head toward China. Uh, they are either one, having more uh, hog production after ASF and the devastation to the largest uh, swine herd in the world, which exists in China and still does. Uh, they've either recovered from that and they need more feed or they're building up strategic uh, storehouses again, which they've been known to have multi years worth of storage uh, for uh, crops like soybeans in China. Um, and, and just, you know, they'd already seen a lot of our uh, corn and they usually take a lot of sorghum as well. So China's rebuilding a lot of that demand. And then not only did they drive up prices in Brazil, guess what? They're driving up prices for the United States, continue to take exports out of here as well. So it, it's a very important aspect that 
uh, right now, the markets are fresh. The markets are calling for uh, our grains, our oil seeds. So we need to fill those up and take advantage of what some potential maybe even for out years to be able to lock in uh, some more favorable prices than what we've seen for quite some time. So it, it, it's important that we put in a marketing structure right now to look at that plan for not just the immediate, but also going off into the future. And it can be difficult to do to think about right when we're still in the middle of, you know, a very busy harvest season, but it, it's important that we do such. Now, will Brazil bring more grain in? The next question is they've got the beginnings of a La Nina weather pattern and they could be dry. They have been dry. So could they have some planning difficulties? Maybe what we get is a one year reprieve uh, to this whole thing that we've got this marketing year that we can be able to move stuff. You know what? That one year reprieve may be something we need to market off of and be able to, you know, give ourselves some room so that we continue to operate with our farms here. Uh, so it's important we consider all these aspects. But longer term, Mike's exactly right. I mean, we just had our uh, market study trip from Iowa Farm Bureau. And Dirk, you went on that trip with us in the middle of Brazil into Mato Grosso, and we know they have more productive capacity to bring online, and those could be longer term strategic challenges for us. So we already saw this last year that uh, Brazil shipped three times uh, more corn to Mexico than what they had prior. Guess what? Mexico is our number one corn market. We sure don't want to lose that, do we, Jay? I mean, it's important that we we have that access to that export market potential because, again, Mike mentioned it, um, we will outproduce uh, the market in most times. And then it's a matter of, do you want to depend on ha somebody having a strategic production fallback in order to have market stability? That's not market stability, that's more market risk with what's taking place. So what we've got is more production taking place across the globe, trying to get those export markets. Now, we're blessed with a very strong domestic market, a lot of feed utilization. You're welcome, Mike. Uh, your producers in Illinois, we're glad that we're able to feed that to a lot of birds. We're glad we're able to feed that production to a lot of cattle and a lot of pigs. But at the same time, uh, we've got that really strong production. We wanna have enough uh, available for domestic needs we're generally going to produce more that we need to have the export markets in place as well. And so that's an important aspect that even in the middle of COVID, although we may not be traveling, you know, around the world to look at those markets, we need to make sure that we understand how those export markets come to bear for all of our producers, whether it be in Iowa, Nebraska, or Illinois. Jay, uh, livestock is, and especially cattle are big in Nebraska. How do the international markets look uh, for livestock and meat exports? Well, that, that's been one of the bright spots this year in terms of uh, ongoing growth in, in the export markets. And I, I agree wholeheartedly with what mo both Mike and Sam said in regards to corn and soybeans, because obviously we're, we're keen on those commodities and exports as well. But uh, uh, we're Nebraska is uh, the largest beef exporting state in, in the nation because we have the, such uh, the big processing sector in our state. And not only... Uh, beef and uh, products, but also the offal and the hides and skins and, and the like is, is important to the state as well. And when I when I look at more of the protein sector, the the, the beef and the pork, I look more in Asia and what's happening there because our biggest markets are over there. We've got Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, and of course China. Uh, China's not so big on the beef side right now. Uh, we're trying trying to grow that market. We just got some access to it over the last couple of years. But uh, obviously this year they've been they've been uh, really buying up a lot of our pork because of what Sam had said earlier about the ASF and their pork production, and so uh, they have really been in in the in the pork markets this year. And looking ahead to next year, if we can if the economy can stabilize, we can get beyond this COVID. For for some of the protein sectors, I I tend to look more at the underlying income can get conditions, economic growth conditions, and the population growth in those countries because as they grow and get more wealthy they want to spend their disposable income on on higher value uh, foods and products and that's where our meats come in so i think there's a tremendous amount of potential there there right now it, it looks like uh, we're going to finish the, this year with some uptick and some exports uh, to those countries and, and overall both in beef and pork 
but uh, and then next year there's the projecting some potential growth there because of there's a, a, a sense that we're going to get back to some sense of normalcy in terms of economic growth. We'll get through this, we'll learn how to to live with this COVID and adjust to it and, and adapt and move forward. And, and I think uh, I was just watching a, a webinar yesterday on the processing sector and how they've learned to live. And, and I think that'll help us in retaining those export markets overseas and, and keeping the, the product flowing overseas. We've already covered a lot of ground here, and that's just part one. We plan to release part two later this week, where our esteemed economists will dive deeper into how farming is changing in their respective states and how COVID-19 has impacted the ag landscape over the past few months. To listen in to part two, as well as part three of the series, be sure to subscribe to the Spokesman Speaks podcast in your favorite podcast app, and don't miss those upcoming episodes. And with that, we'll wrap up this episode of the podcast. We truly appreciate all of you for tuning in, including our neighbors from Nebraska and Illinois. Thank you for doing the work that strengthens agriculture across the Midwest and throughout the entire country. And thanks for listening to The Spokesman Speaks. Thank you for listening to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast by Iowa Farm Bureau. Check out more podcast episodes at iowafarmbureau.com slash podcast. You can also find and subscribe to the Spokesman Speaks podcast in the Apple Podcasts app, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and other popular podcast apps. We appreciate your ratings and reviews, and we welcome you to email us your feedback at podcast at ifbf.org.